the hallway gallery, we have Quiet Ruptures by Alexander Squire. So uh, without further ado, you can take it away. Please feel free to ask questions during um, this talk. So it can be a bit more conversational. If you'll do me a favor and kind of like raise your hand so I can pass you the mic, that would be great. But go ahead. Uh, thanks. Um, so this show, Quiet Ruptures, is a collection of prints and drawings. All, the, all my uh, works that are drawings are on this wall. And everything on this wall are different methods of printmaking. Uh, so my background is in printmaking primarily. Um, so I, I don't know, printmaking is a world that just like, there's infinite options to try in terms of methods, technique, uh, different sort of steps and structures. And that's something that I really like to have as an artist is like some kind of methodology or a structure uh, in terms of making work. Like painting kind of scares me a little bit, I'll admit, because it's just so open in terms of like decision making and possibility. So I enjoy the act of painting and I might make like a painting every two years. Uh, but in general, I really love printmaking as like an extension of my drawing practice. So everything goes back to drawing for me. It's like the thing that I started doing really young and uh, it just feels the most natural. Um, so a little bit about the content of this work uh, and then I can get into the technical kind of processes and we can talk about that and ask questions about that. Um, I'm really attracted, I grew up in Houston, uh, so I'm a native Houstonian. I've lived in Boston and upstate New York, um, and I've had the good fortune of being able to travel a lot um, in my life. You know, my, my family is from uh, Peru, but I also have family in Europe. And uh, so I've had the opportunity to like travel and see other types of urban environments, other kinds of city planning, and also like history, right? So ruins, uh, you know, archeological sites, uh, like real history that goes back before the 50s. Um, so I'm, I, I think I've always like kind of viewed our urban landscape in Houston through that lens of like sort of a semi-romanticism or at least looking for romanticism in our environment, um, which is sort of like difficult to do in a place like Houston. I mean, if you've lived here your whole life, you're very used to it, I think. Um, but I'm really drawn to these little moments of beauty that exist in contrast to the sort of concrete uh, you know, situation, we'll call it, that we all experience on a daily basis. So like this piece in front of me, for example, like uh, some, and I'll, I guess I'll also distinguish that some of these are like really kind of documentarian in the sense that they are things that I've sampled from the environment and I'm just like taking that photo and create, you know, maybe adjusting the composition, but I'm representing a real thing, right? And then there's other moments, which you can probably tell, that are much more like created, imagined, uh, and, and that are extrapolated from these types of situations, but then kind of re uh, collage in a way and come out into this type of work. Um, but so this is like a real moment at a gas station. Um, just these planters like that are next to the pumps, like I think they're hilarious and awesome at the same time. Like, you know, some of them are in terrible shape, but some of them are really well maintained and really beautiful. And you got to like, it kind of like, tells a story, it makes you think about like the gas station owner and this like decision to like have this little beautiful moment next to this pump uh, that, you know, we're all pumping gas like every week, you know? So it's, I don't know, the same thing on the freeways, right? There'll be sometimes little moments of beauty or planters there. Uh, I love like the occasional palm tree that you see growing out of the side of the freeway. Uh, I'm really drawn to those moments. So in a way, those are kind of like it's it's a it's like a coexistence of natural elements and then man-made elements that I'm really drawn to, like those moments of contrast where they're working together as opposed to really kind of like working apart from each other, right? But I'm inspired by those moments of discord as well. Um, yeah, so I think that kind of covers the general idea of like my inspirations for the for the work. You know, some of these are just moments from our, from the city. This one here is uh, like the 59 freeway. If you've ever gone that like. If you're heading towards downtown, you pass the Kirby exit, and you keep going. You go down that little, like, not subterranean, but it goes down. You've got the bridges in Montrose, or in the Montrose area, right? They cross over the museum district. So the, that's an example of those, like, giant red spheres that are on top of the freeway. Um, the ones that I've sampled in this drawing are the, to me, they come from the ones that you find along, along 610 under the exits, you know, around the loop, um, at least on the west side of 610. Um, yeah, so all those types of things are what I'm drawn to. There's a little bit of like architectural criticism involved as well for me. Like I'm sort of an amateur uh, architecture student, I guess, for the last like 20 years. Um, if I hadn't gone to school for art, I probably would have done that. So, you know, 
if, if my focus is on all these issues that I see within the landscape that has led me to research like urban development, urban planning, uh, construction, architecture. And so I use a lot of that type of uh, illustration actually as like, you know, structures for me to create artwork as well. So this, for example, is like an isometric drawing. Um, so I'll often start with something that is like in an architectural language or in a planning language. Um, but that also references historical methods of representing like urban space, right? So you had like Renaissance, uh, you know, the development of one point and, and two point perspective in like the Italian Renaissance. There's Asian uh, illustrations uh, that are sort of similar to this, like isometric, but turned that 90 degrees. So you have these like, you can see all the facades and you can also see the interiors of the homes. So the way that like you can create these sceneries that discuss the relationship of the buildings to the landscape, but also to the people that use them and inhabit them um, is also something I'm really interested in. And then the last thing I'll say on this diatribe about architecture is, uh, you know, Houston, I think, because it's exploded after, you know, in the 60s and then again in like the 70s and 80s, really, uh, up into the 90s. Uh, but you have a lot of postmodern architecture, um, which to me is defined by essentially kind of like a playful, we'll call it playful in its best, you know, examples, uh, dist distillation and sampling of other architectural styles, right? So, you know, uh, you see it with stucco, the stucco homes that are built around the city. You'll see the like Georgian coins on the side of the building or like just a, one little outline around the door, you know, an implied archway of some kind. Um, but it's all just like very diluted and very simplistic, almost like, like if you've ever been to the Children's Museum, like I love that museum. And that's like an instance where I think the playfulness of that kind of architecture works a little bit, but it does look like a toy in a way, you know? And so that's the kind of thing that I, I'm also like, well, why is nobody pushing in a new in, in a new direction, like you know, or, or trying to redefine uh, style or something, which is like if you talk to architects about that, there's, that's a whole thing. But uh, it's all been done. Uh, but anyway, I'll stop there. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, I'd love to tell you more about the content, or if you want to know how some of these things were made. Um, yeah. Drawings. How do you decide to do drawings in ink? or graphite, like how do you? Uh, so the question was how do I decide whether I'm gonna use graphite or ink when I do my drawings? And uh, I, 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 same thing with printmaking. I mean, a drawing is wide open in a way, like there's so much to try. Uh, graphite is very, it's very fluid. It's very, it's like, it feels like painting in a way when you draw with graphite, I think. Um, and pen and ink is obviously very exacting and very like, you know, it's, you're gonna get the same intensity of black with every mark that you make. So I, I enjoy different things about working in different materials and I just vacillate. Like I'm really ADHD with my processes. Like I'm not gonna make 12 drawings in the same way in a row, uh, cause I'll just get bored of it uh, and need to do something else. Also that kill my wrist, you know? So like, and then Prince, I'm, I'm, I'm always at like a, an overload of like ideas to try in terms of print, print ideas, different methods, uh, different interpretations of the same image. Uh, and that's something that I'm probably gonna be working on this year. Is like, I have a goal of doing like one, of, one gas station planter a month, for example, but I wanna do them really large. And now that I've done this, this is a silkscreen monoprint, by the way. So this is using water-soluble crayons through a stencil, through a mesh, which is, if you've ever done silk screening on t-shirts or anything like that, same method, but for fine art. Um, and you can use water-soluble media through the screen. So. I've done, I love watercolor because it kind of like is a tie between drawing, print, and painting. Like it kind of, I can incorporate it in that way. So uh, there's a couple other examples of my use of watercolor. Uh, that print right there, and then the two on the end over there, those are all of a certain method that's called white line printing or white line woodcut. Um, also, it's referred to as Provincetown printing because it ostensibly was developed in Provincetown, uh, Massachusetts by a group of artists up there who were looking for ways to make reproductions of their watercolor paintings of like coastal scenes um, and landscapes. Uh, and so that's a method that I really like because it sort of uh, allows me to do a lot with a little, right? It still gives me a structure, but I have a full image that I can, uh, I can try different color combinations and different iterations. So what we call mono printing when you're making prints, it's the same image, but it's a different version every time, right? And I like that ability. Sometimes I really enjoy the process of making an addition like the small freeway print there, there's 10 of those, right? So that's more of a traditional approach to printmaking. I'm gonna do these layers of color, I'm gonna create a graphic image, and I'm gonna make copies of it, essentially, right? 
and then I can sell copies or I can distribute copies. But sometimes the like reasoning behind making multiples doesn't really like have a place in what I'm doing necessarily. So sometimes the fact that I may end up with like an addition or copies of prints is really just like a, a secondary result to me of the method that I'm using because I just really enjoy the method, right? And I enjoy the graphic result on paper. Um, but that's why I like to try stuff like this where there's no, I'm never going to be able to recreate this print exactly the same way. Um, and the same thing with the woodblock prints. I get to try different iterations. Maybe I'm not done with the image, but I'm done with this version of it so I can try something else. Yeah. Hey. Hi, Alex. I haven't seen you since the pandemic, but so is, this is really nice. And um, <laughs> I just wanted to say, oh, I'll try to project a little bit louder for everyone. But um, I remember uh, seeing your earlier paintings from 2019. Uh -huh. And um, this is like a really wonderful um, way of like seeing how you've progressed. Um, since then, um, but I do have a question sure. and I know it might not be so fair on everyone because I've seen your earlier work um, like your sculptural works mm -hmm. at Lawndale um, and I was very intrigued by them and what I wondered, I mean, I'm not sure how to like make an image for the rest of you who haven't seen Alex's um, sculptural works, um, but uh, I really enjoyed the sort of research behind it and the materiality and how you put things together. So, um, I mean, I can definitely sort of see it coming through uh, these works. Um, but I was wondering, like, how do you, like, how, do, how does this um, practice of making these images relate maybe to your earlier practice? Are they... Um, opening up new avenues for you in terms of like, w would you sort of like, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I and mean, the question was essentially, how does the 2D graphic work that you see in this show kind of like relate to my other, other parts of my practice, which are predominantly sculptural or installation based or a little bit more conceptual maybe? Um, well, maybe not. I don't know about that last part, but uh, I think Again, it, it goes back to like my wanting to try lots of different things always, and so getting bored with doing one thing. But also, I've always done two D work. It's like oh, it's kind of the foundation of everything I've done, right? It's it's how I even even those sculptural works that you're referring to, with the exception of maybe a couple, uh, like involve like drawings or prints, and then maybe kind of evolved out of that. Um, so, so just to give a brief example, I mean, of what of what uh, Leanne is talking about. Uh, I've done installations in, in houses, taken over a ranch house, turned that into sort of an archaeological site. Uh, I, I have a brick archive that I created with 450 bricks that I found around Houston and turned that into a mobile museum about uh, bricks and tracing their arrivals to Houston, like migratory uh, you know, trails, essentially. Um, so again, you can just from that, I think you can kind of hear like ranch house from the 60s, bricks from construction sites and uh, demolition sites. So, it's, it's all tying in in terms of the same like interest in the built environment, in history, and in our relationship to the landscape. Yeah, but okay. I've always, I've I always, totally get, I totally get the yeah. whole, like, I get bored of things. Yeah. And I want to sort of like jump from one thing to the next. But yeah, no, I, yeah, yeah. thank you. I think, the, I mean, I'll just say one last thing on that. Um, I think the other reason I really wanted to do something like this is that I've done a few installations and that kind of work, big sculptural work and whatnot, but I, I moved back to Houston in 2015 to do that house installation, actually, and I have not had a show of like just 2D, like straightforward, like let's frame some some images and put them on the wall kind of show since I've been back in town. And I've been teaching printmaking for like 12 years. I've been teaching drawing, and I haven't had a show of that work. So I really like wanted to do that also. So that's a part of it, you know. Um, and you'll notice when you look through the show, maybe if you haven't already, but the work dates from 2020 through now, really. Uh, and that's because the show was originally slated to happen in 2020. And obviously for you know COVID, as everybody knows, things were pushed back. Um, but also that changed the way I could work, right? So that print of the uh, pyramids, it's called Mountains of Caution over there. Um, that was a print that was intended for that show, right? And it hasn't mm -hmm. been shown yet. So I really wanted to include it in this as sort of the beginning of this trajectory of work that happened over the last three-ish years, right? So yeah. 
I had to change what I was doing, but that led to just like a period of experimentation, essentially. And also embracing that white line woodcut technique, which is something I could do at home and didn't need a print shop for. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be reminded that artists have very sort of multi-layered practices. Yeah, don't pigeonhole me. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? All right. We can move on.